Hey everybody, welcome to NA Lit Chat. It is Thursday, February 13th, and it is 9 p.m. Since it's the day before Valentine's Day, we are here to talk about matchmaking for your publishing career. This is something that is a bit of a new decision for authors when the world of publishing has opened up beyond just the agents and the typical query. You can have an agent, you can self-publish, or you can go with a small press. We have two very special guests here with us tonight to tell us the ins and outs of all of these things and to help you choose the absolute right person to further your career. Please join me welcoming Cora Cormack and KK Hendon. Hey Cora, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Did you have snow today? I did. It snowed pretty crazily this morning, blizzard-like conditions. <laughs> Uh, same here, and I think KK is also pretty close to us. Hey, KK, are you there? I'm here. Welcome. How was your? You had an exciting snow day, if I'm not mistaken. All the snow, all the salting, all the shoveling, <laughs> all all the snow things. All the good stuff. I don't know how we exciting have, that is. <laughs> well, we have uh, Kat, Alicia, Cat Vansel, and St. Ben. They're going to be on Twitter with you guys. And we have EJ Wesley. He is going to be telling us what you guys are tweeting and making sure we know. We also have a new Q&A feature on the Google Hangout. So if you have a burning question to ask either one of our guests or you want to make sure we ask on the air, please use that and let us know. Hey, EJ, how are you tonight? I am doing fantastic. Um, just hanging out here, watching Twitter, watching about 40 different windows, actually. And <laughs> <laughs> kind of like being a tasker. Air just, traffic control. Exactly, exactly. So do we have any good news on Twitter? Uh, I haven't seen any roll across yet, but um, I'm right, sure well, it's we, coming. So. Why don't we get a little bit more information on each of our guests? Hey, Cora, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you write and your books? Sure. Um, well, obviously I write new adults. That's kind of why I'm here. Yes. <laughs> um, but I write uh, new adult contemporary romance at the moment. Um, I have one complete series that just actually finished, um, which is the Losing It series. It's got three complete novels, Losing It, Faking It, and Finding It, and then two novellas, the last of which just came out a couple of weeks ago, and that was Seeking Her. And today I just revealed um, the new cover for uh, the first book in my new series, the Rescue University series. The book is called All Lined Up, and it's sort of a new adult version of Friday Night Lights. Um, I tend to write things a bit on the quirky um, humorous side, um, and my books are usually very character-driven. That's me, in a nice. nutshell. And you're a Texas girl, right? So do football and Texas go hand in hand the I, way people say they do? Oh, yes. Um, I, I, I live in New York now, but I, I grew up in Texas. I lived in Texas my whole life. And my dad was actually a football and a basketball coach, so that's part of why I wrote this new series, is that um, I grew up being the coach's daughter, and so it's a world that I know really well. And so it was something that was really easy for me to sort of translate. Um, into a new novel. Very cool. Well, we'll definitely get your new cover reveal up and shared with everybody on Twitter. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Hey, KK. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. KK, what do you like to write? Tell us about your book. <laughs> what do I like to write? Um, well, I generally write also, like Cora, a new adult, contemporary. Um, they all have romantic elements, but they're not per se 100% romance. Um, apparently they usually involve people needing tissues when they read them, so <laughs> there's always that little, um, caveat before you pick up a book. Um, I have one out called Heart Breaths. It came out in November, and my next one is coming out next month. It's called Only the Good Die Young, and it's about an 18-year-old girl with breast cancer who okay. hates everybody and everything. That definitely sounds a little bit painful, but funny, <laughs> painful if it, you know. Yeah, she's, she's hilarious. It. She's hilarious. Awesome. But Very she cool. just, yeah, all so, fun things. EJ, I'm seeing a couple things. It looks like we all missed getting to see Chelsea Cameron at Coastal Magicon. She was on an NA panel down there. Right. Um, um, what else yeah. do you have for us? Uh, Clara Wallace, NA, uh, tweeted that she just finished copy edits for her story, Push. Uh, now I just have to wait until the May 1st release date. That's always the worst part. Good luck, Claire. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, once you've done that and you've done all the work for it, it's really good. Yeah, then you just have to take yes. your mind off of it and do right. other things. Write another uh, book. Right, exactly. I think that is really the best medicine, to be honest. Um, Jane Lucas yes. says, 
good news, my girls at Lynn James and at Paige Galvin just published their first NA together, Unfiltered and Unknown. I love that title. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, that brings up the point, we're going to try to do a chat, another chat. We've done one in the past um, on co-authoring in the future. So uh, that might, maybe they would be good candidates to have one air or bring in the chat to talk. So, Oh, and my, we did have our first Q&A question. Of course, it was from Michael Simcoe. Uh, so you can only imagine what this is going to be. He says, what's the betting line of words spoken during this chat? I'm betting three times over our guy's night week. So, very good, Michael. Very good. Oh, and, right, and DA Votto wants to know... Yeah. Um, What's the worst way to get an agent? So I don't, we have to address that towards the end of the chat. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that, DA. We'll get to that. So part of the reason that we chose to have, uh, that we asked to have Cora and KK on tonight is not just because they are fabulous writers, because they are, but both of them have gone out of their way to really educate themselves on the business side. They both have worked for small publishers in the past, and they both have worked at agencies. So they have a lot of insider information on not just, you know, how to query, because there's lots of sites that can tell you that, but they are both here tonight to talk to us about going beyond the query and really identifying the right person for you, the right person for your books, and the right person for your career. So, Cora, yes. where do you start to find an agent? What are the basic resources that people want to know, that people need to know that are, you know, just the right amount of information? Um, I mean, there's lots of great websites out there. Um, I, I, in my early days, learned almost everything from Absolute Right and the forums there. Um, I was on there a lot. There's also some great um, agent blogs. Um, he's not an agent anymore, but he's still got a lot of information. The Nathan Bransford's blog. Also, Query Shark is a great place to start. Um, but honestly, before you start thinking about an agent at all, you just have to make sure that your book is ready. Um, so many, I mean, in my time working both for a, a publisher and a literary agency, I can tell you um, that I got so many queries or so many submissions of things that sounded really great and were just on the cusp of being of being something really wonderful, um, but they just queried before they were ready. They queried before they'd really, um, you know, edited the book well and before they'd really gotten a handle on their their query. So um, my, my first advice before you go looking for an agent or go researching it is to finish your manuscript and make sure it's as strong as you can possibly make it. Well, I think that there's there's a bit of a myth there that, you know, everybody everybody knows that once you get an agent, they're likely to go through lots of edits with you um, before mm -hmm. they even take you on submission. So I think there's a little bit of that fantasy that says, well, they're going to love this if they love it, and we're still going to work on it together. But from what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense considering how many things that they see in any given week, that's not good enough. Well, I mean, it's it, it does happen that the agents will take on people for... Um, you know, with an R and R, or they'll take on something before um, it's ready. These days, usually it's an R and R, uh, and they're not going to take you on until they're certain. And part Can of that is because you define R and R for us. Sorry, just in sure, case um, know. Sure, revise and resubmit. Okay. Um, so if they if they see potential in your work, but it's just not ready, um, they'll often give give you notes and let you if let you come back. Um, but even then, you have to really perform on those notes. Um, you can't just, they're not looking for you to turn around something in a week and get it right back to them. They're looking for you to approach this book um, in an editing mindset the same way you would if you had an editor, which means really uh, diving in and, and taking care of all of their notes, not just making surface fixes. Um, but the market's so difficult these days, um, especially uh, especially in NA or YA or, or any of those things. Everything's it's such a crowded market, and it's such a hard um, sell right now. Everything's a hard sell, and so um, I'll, I'm seeing at least a lot less uh, agents who are willing to take a chance on that because the fact of the matter is, um, every every minute, every hour that they spend working on your stuff, from query through uh, signing you on as a client through edits, through all of those things, they're doing all of that for free. Um, and they're doing all of it with the hopes that it'll pay off. Um, and so if they're going to spend that much time working for free, um, they, have to, they have to feel pretty confident in your work. And so it has to be in really good shape. That makes a lot of sense. Now, do you, um, when, when an editor, when an agent turns a piece down, is there a polite way to ask for feedback, even if you know, like, Chances of them 
you're not going to necessarily go back to them. They haven't requested an R and R. But is there a nice way to say, could you give me a little bit of feedback here, please? Because I know that it's not always possible. But is there a good way to go about that? Uh, I would just recommend against it um, unless you have a rapport with the agent, unless you have emailed back, um, you know, several times back and forth, and they've given you notes or something like that before. Um, in an R and R type scenario, say you do uh, revisions for them, and then they still um, decide to pass. That's a little bit different, but the average submission, it's a big no-no to write back uh, because the fact of the matter is, I mean, we all love agents who answer all their queries and who answer them with personal details, um, but that takes an immense, an immense amount of time. Um, and, and frankly, um, agents who answer queries at all are taking a lot more time than they could, than they could take if they just did a no response means no. And so right. there's something a little off-putting about, you know, they've taken the time to actually give you a response, which not everyone does, and then when people come back and ask for more, even if it's done in the most polite way possible, it's still a bit off-putting because, again, you're asking them um, to work for free and not just to work for free on a book that they might potentially take on, but to work for free on something they know they have no future with. Okay. So that's so part of part of it. That's really that's really good to think about. Um, so KK, you are in a unique position because you did I think you interned at a literary agency, but you also no. run the Tumblr. <laughs> I did it. You did it. I just run I run the Tumblr. No. You run the I Tumblr. Not Tell us about the Tumblr because the Tumblr in addition to sites like Publishers Weekly, which can talk to you about deals, and Publishers Marketplace, which can give you lists of who to submit to, the Tumblr is sort of the magic beans that combines agents and editors with their <laughs> wish list. So tell us I what's like on that. there magic. and why people yeah. should look at it and what people have gotten out of it. Okay, so the it's called the MSWL Tumblr. It stands for the Manuscript Wish List, and it's an archive of the Twitter party, I guess, <laughs> that happened, that's happened twice so far, it's happening again, February 22nd, uh, 26th, sorry, um, in which agents and editors will tweet what they're looking for in a book, their manuscript wish list. So what I do in running the Tumblr is I'll archive all the tweets and I'll so on each tweet will be, the header of the tweet is the name of the agent or editor, and then the tweet, the tweet Tumblr post itself is the tweet and their Twitter handle, and then there'll be tags on the bottom of the name, whether it's an agent or editor, and then what genre they're talking about, as much information as I can tag on the bottom for easier searching. What's great about it is that it really gives you an insight into what the agents and editors are both looking for, and there are a lot of posts. I'm not finished archiving from the last time because people just keep posting and posting, which is great, and it's really nice to have everybody so enthusiastic about this. But at last check, there are over, there are around 1,200 posts so far, I think, wow. on the Tumblr. That yeah. is fantastic. And <laughs> I like to, a lot. I like to cross-reference it, so I'll, like, look up everybody there, and I'm, I'm sort of a newbie, and I'm always curious, so I'll take... I'll take the editor or the agent's name, and then I'll run over to Publishers Marketplace and see what they've done before, and yes. and what they're like. Yeah. The, the best part about it is that it really does, you know, it really opens your eyes to some trends. Um, if you see a whole bunch of agents are looking for the same kind of story, and it's something you're writing, like it's a really good sign. Yes. If you see a whole bunch of editors looking for something that you're writing, it's a really good sign. You have to be a little careful because not all the editors will allow for unsolicited submissions. So you need to pay attention yes, to that. Of, but mm -hmm. as far yeah. as to looking for the agents, I think it is such a big bonus for people to see what, what they might have on their wish list. Because I think the biggest thing for, for people to remember when it comes to finding an agent is that you're not looking for somebody who's going to work with you for one book. As Cora just told us, they make a huge investment in just selling that first thing for you. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're going to have a long career with that person, what kinds of questions do you guys think someone really needs to ask when they've maybe met the right person, when there's maybe a little bit of interest? Um, what kind of things should people know before they, you know, really decide if that's the right fit? Cora, okay, okay, you guys can talk to each other or pick whoever um, first. I mean, there's lots of great resources out there of, of things to ask on, on the phone call, and there's tons and tons of questions. I won't go through all of those, um, but... 
but again, it goes back to you know doing your research and knowing the, the business, um, not just on the querying side, but know what to ask of your agents if they if you get an offer um, and they offer you um, and they give you like a an agency agreement or something like that. Do your research. Make sure you're not locking yourself into anything. Um, crazy with that kind of agreement, um, but so it's sort of the things you need to ask are, are twofold. You need to ask them the business side of things and make sure that you guys are going to be a good fit on that side of things. You can ask them how they like to communicate, how often they communicate. If you know that you're the kind of person who's going to be a little needy and needs them to check in all the time, then that might be something that you try and figure out early on because. Some agents are great with the hand holding, and some are not so great with the hand holding, and they just um, will be sort of radio silence until they have some news for you. Um, so you want to figure out sort of on the that side of things whether you can logistically work with that person. But then also part of it is just it, it's heart um, uh, is figuring out whether or not your aesthetic matches their aesthetic, and um, talking about where you see yourself going in your career and whether or not that it's um, a sustainable trajectory to stay with that one person. If you're going to you know, move into a different genre or if you, know, you like to write lots of different things, then that's something you'll want to figure out with that agent is whether or not they can cover you um, on other things you're interested in writing too. So I think that one of the key... Yeah. Oh, oh I, EJ. I, I was just laughing. Chelsea Cameron said that, uh, and this is obviously tiny cheek, showing up at their door with your manuscript and a box of Girl Scout cookies and a knife is always helpful. <laughs> <laughs> always. Yeah. Don't, don't um, do I've seen that before, though. Uh, but, uh, Chelsea actually has a good point. She says, uh, if you're querying agents, you know, and these are, I, and I think I'm listening to Cora and KK talk about these. There really are little details that are helpful. Like, and, and Chelsea did mention, she's like, you know, make sure you spell the na agent's name right. Uh, make sure they rep your job. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, those are little steps you can take with just a little bit of research uh, yeah. online to figure. Make that sure stuff out. you actually query an agent and not me. Right. I'm not right. an <laughs> agent. Send it to the Tumblr. I get log queried lady. all the time. Right. You know, guys, you're. I get. I have such an appreciation for agents because people are like, oh my god, yeah. People, you know, will submit these ridiculous things. I get submitted to a lot, and like, not even necessarily just for like. Queries, like, I'll get the same letter, like, four times in a row just with the name changed yeah. on top. Like, yeah. magically, I'm just going to find the agent and just pass it along. And then half the time, this is what really bothers me, as long as we're hearing our feelings, half the time, these books are like, oh, FYI, I already self-published. Yeah. And I want you or to represent this book. Or what's worse is when they don't tell you that they've already self-published. That's, that's even <laughs> worse, when they just kind of try and slide it in. Um, again, it's that idea that um, you know. Anytime you query an agent, think of the fact that they are reading all of these queries. They're not getting paid for it, and so it's it's the idea that you owe it you you owe it to them to do your research, um, whether it's you know about submission guidelines and make sure you're following um, you know everything that they wanted you to send. Make sure you're sending it to the right emails. Make sure it's something that they actually represent. Um, yes. All of those kinds of things. I mean, it's. They, they put in this time that they're not getting paid for, and so uh, a good author, someone who's, you know, who's taking that into consideration, will, um, on the flip side, also put in that time for free, you know, doing research, figuring out um, what the agent wants, figuring out how to spell their name, all those kinds of things. So it's just putting in effort. Well, and it's I think putting yourself out there professionally and, mm -hmm. and really putting things together in a way that somebody could say yes to. If you're writing your letters with toothpaste, I mean, I know that's crazy and hardly done, <laughs> but I actually also worked at a talent agency for a while, and you would be amazed at the people that do show up with scripts and manuscripts and Girl Scout cookies and knives, and it is, it's no joke. People do not always present themselves as professionally as they should. Now, you guys just both brought up something that we were going to talk about a little bit later, but since there's a natural segue, what do people do if they have self-published and they still would like to get an agent? Is there a chance? Is there a good way to handle this? Is there some good timing? Or do you just have to roll the dice and hope your book does good enough that agents come to you? Cora, do you, I know that you have yeah. your own personal experience. Why don't you tell us what happened to you? And then maybe some advice if you have it. Sure. Well, my first question would be, um, why does that person want an agent? Um, because the fact of the matter is, if you've already self-published a book, unless that book sells extraordinarily well, an agent can't do anything for you. Um, a lot of times, when I was still working at, at an agency, um, 
the kind of query letters we would get from people who had already self-published, it felt a little bit more like they were looking for a publicist than an agent. They were thinking, you know, I, I self-pub this book, it's not doing as well as I wanted, so maybe I should get an agent and they'll help me sell more books. That's not really the way it works, again, because any time that an agent's putting into a book is for free. And so when you've already self-published a book, that takes their likelihood of being able to get a deal and make money off of it um, it makes it very, very, very slim. Um, so you have to, your book has to do incredibly well. Um, my story, I'll try and make it fast. <laughs> um, but essentially, you know, I, I, I decided to self-publish um, with that, uh, with the hope in mind that my book would do well enough um, to get agent attention and to get publisher attention. Because at the time when I self-published losing it, my first book. Um, the only publishers who were taking new adults at all were e-publishers, and so I just kind of figured, you know, if I if it was only going to be an e-book, I might as well, you know, keep it for my myself and have some control over it, um, and and have a chance. And so I self-published losing it. It just kind of was one of those miraculous events, and it was a perfect storm scenario. It happened at exactly the right time when new adult was sort of on its first big explosion, um, and I had agents contacting me within three days of release. Because um, they were seeing it on like the charts on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and things like that, um, and so that's that's sort of what happened to me. That's that's not necessarily normal by any means, um, but um, that's <laughs> that's what happened, I guess. But I think I mean, <laughs> and that is that is something to be so proud of, and that level of success with any book, whether it's released with a traditional publisher, a small press, or as an individual, is really something. That speaks very well of the manuscript it's, of the manuscript itself. Um, I do know quite a number of authors who have received queries or received interest from agents after their book has been out for a little bit of time, and that's a good stepping mm -hmm. stone to building a long-term career. Um, do you think it's important, um, as somebody who self-published initially, to find an agent that would be supportive of that over the long term, or do you think once you go with an agent, the idea is that that's not something you would like to do again? You can speak per personally or just in general. Um, well, I think again, it's it's that idea of you have to know what you want. Um, for me, um, I I didn't necessarily self-publish because I was intent on on being an indie author and having all the control myself. For me, it was just the smartest decision at that time. I could feel like the market was coming to a head, and if I had to wait for a publisher to put my book out, I had a feeling that I would be too late. And so for me, the reason I self-published was mostly for time, um, because I could just I could just kind of see the market getting there, um, and, and that's why it worked out for me. Um, but if you if you have agents, you know, coming to you um, after after you've already published your book, um, again, I would just tell you to figure out what you want. Um, if you're wanting to go on and be, um, you know, get a traditional contract after that, then yeah, you definitely want to have an agent. Um, not to say you cannot get a traditional contract without one, but I can speak from experience. How do I put this generically? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to give any specifics, but um, I mean, I know I know other authors whose books were self-published first, like mine, who sold just as well as my book did. Um, like we have like talked numbers and compared numbers, and um, and I I know that I got stronger offers with an agent than people I know who who were in the same situation, either without an agent. Or with that, with an agent who wasn't necessarily the most experienced agent in the world, <laughs> um, I, I just by having an agent alone, um, I got better offers. And then even my my agent turned around and and you know worked some magic, and we got bigger offers in an auction. Um, right. And so um, and then not to mention even on, like not even including the money side of things, um, it was actually my agency who got my deal announced in the New York Times, which was. The first time new adult made any headline on a major on a major news source, um, and that never would have happened. I mean, my publisher didn't do that for me. I didn't do that for me. That was my literary agent who did that for me. I think Cora brings up that's a fantastic point. Like uh, publishing in every level, it seems, is a reputation business, um, mm -hmm. and you know, agents have reputations with publishers, um, right? Good and bad. Right. Uh, yeah. Authors Just by the sheer just by having, um, I mean, some agents, just because they have that reputation and they have 
um, relationships built with edit editors. Right. Um, the same manuscript represented by two different agents could come out getting drastically different offers based on just who your agent is. Sure. Uh, back uh, one, one thing I wanted to throw out from Twitter is since we were talking about resources earlier, <laughs> uh, Sarah uh, Harian, I apologize, Sarah, if I'm mispronouncing your names, uh, but basically she said to queriers, a PM subscription equals a great idea. If agent offers, yeah. you can easily access all of their deals and see if they're selling yeah. or not. Uh, and is that, is that Publishers Marketplace? Is that right? Yep. What, yeah, oh, yeah, Publishers Marketplace. Okay, yeah. I want to make sure I got the reference correct. But um, so that I thought that was an excellent tip. There were a couple more little tidbits from Twitter that I thought were great. Um, uh, Megan Erickson said, "the The more I get involved in this business, the more I think you need to mesh well personality-wise with your agent," um, mm -hmm. which I think echoes a lot of what Corey and KK and people were saying about you know find an agent with a great personality or a personality that fits you, like whether you need handholding or don't need handholding. Um, yeah. yeah. I also asked Twitter too. I said, you know, when you query, just out of curiosity, is you know how how many query letters did you send out at a time? Like how many agents did you query individually, and then how long did it take you to get them back? Uh, we had a couple interesting answers. Um, Claire Wallace, uh, say, NA says, I queried 24 agents. I got 12 rejections, three manuscript requests, and never heard from the rest. Um, then Danielle uh, Ellens uh, says, I don't recall the number, but everyone was pretty good about replying. Uh, Karina Press was passed within three weeks, and so that's something I was curious to get. Our, you know, Cora and KK, uh, any perspective you guys have on you yeah. know, what's the response time, or should you get your feelings hurt if they don't ever respond to you? You know, kind of what's the process there? I um, think um, a big part of this whole thing is to remember that it's a business, and you need to treat it like a business. And if you're walking in, you're like, oh, I'm just going to send, you know, my query letter to people. And they're going to love my book and it's going to be beautiful. You No, it's, I mean, I really hate to be the voice of doom and gloom because I'm really not. But, like, if you're not treating it like a business, if you're not treating your own writing and your own career professionally, then you're not giving off a vibe that anybody else is going to want to treat you professionally. And that, I think, is a very big piece of the whole querying, publishing, writing process in general is at a certain point you can't really take things personally if people don't answer you because it's a business for you and it's a business for them on bottom line. At the end of the day, you know, you both want to make money to do what you love. Mm -hmm. And if you're not hearing responses back from people, it can't be like, oh, no, they didn't love me, they didn't love my book. Sometimes you don't get calls back in any job. So it's kind of like a job hunt, I guess. Well, and that's what, with yeah. the book. Well, I, I always, I can't remember, there was some, I was on a panel once, and I likened it, I have a theater background, so I likened querying to going to an audition um, in a city yeah. like New York, where, say, they're looking for, yep. you know, one, they're looking for, like, a quirky girl, okay, and then you walk into the audition, and there are literally, like, 80 girls who are the same body type as you, they look yeah. and act just like you, um, and they're just looking for, literally, it's like a, a sea full of clones, and they're just looking for that one person that has a little something special that sticks out, or um, sometimes it's about, like, you know, really crazy things, like height, like, and how they're going to match up with other, you know, actors, and that's kind of how, um, how querying is. Um, there can be a manuscript that an agent really enjoys. They can read. I, there were, when I was agenting, there were manuscripts that I read the entire thing. I really enjoyed it. I still didn't offer because for whatever reason, it's about um, finding a perfect match, not just uh, for, the, for a writer finding their perfect match in the agent, but also agents are looking for perfect matches in writers. And so um, mm -hmm. when you get rejected, you can't take it as a, you know, I'm terrible or, or they didn't like it at all. It's merely that they were looking for, you know, this special long-term relationship, and you weren't the perfect fit for that. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can't beat yourself up over not being a perfect fit. Here's an interesting question from uh, D.A. Boda, and he would like to know how creative should writers get with their queries? Is it just boring fonts and no style, or should you be looking to make oh, some God, sort of no professional font. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my crazy God. font. Yeah, I, I think I know the answer to this. <laughs> no scented letters. Um, yeah. <laughs> no scented letters. No a query letter from your is a business letter. Oh my god. No. Oh no, please no. Yes. 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 Query letters are they're a business no. letter. So no, don't get creative. No uh, there are people out there, I mean you'll see advice out there on query letters that 
that agents want to see your voice in it, and sometimes people take that a little too far. Either, as KK said, they'll um, you know write the query from their character's point of view, which don't do it. Just don't. Don't do that. Don't um, please. Or they'll please. they'll go out of their way to be sort of um, really like goofy or out there in their query letter, and it's all it all it all just reads as gimmick. Even if you even if you mean really well, it reads as gimmick. So um, I'm writing a spy story, and I decided to write my query letter in Wingdings. So they would have to. Oh my God! <laughs> is that EJ. is that bad? Should I EJ. Thought, EJ. I thought it was. We a, love I you a, a lot. Guy. We really do. We really love you, and we mean this from the bottom of our hearts in the nicest place. For the love of God and everything that is holy. Please. I thought, I thought it was a whole. Story. You want to be on like the blacklist. Uh, I would say. I, mean, I can't imagine. So like, I really can't imagine. Like, I, I imagine like shutter. agents get like. Scented paper, like I imagine oh, they get all this yes. stuff. Like, like, like Elle Woods. Queries are better. Like Elle Woods, we can probably simpler. do that. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, queries are always going to be better the simpler they are. Um, I cannot tell you. I I mean, when I was when I was agenting, I would read, you know, good good query letters. But if they, I I frequently when I would give feedback, um, when I did, you know, give personal feedback on just a query letter, almost always it was to cut their query almost in half. Um, less is very frequently more because you have to think that uh, most agents are sitting there and they're reading you know anywhere from 20 to 100 query letters in one sitting and so um, anytime your query starts to drag at all you risk losing their attention and so um, short and sweet um, really something that has like a, a punch and gets right to the point um, I find that those are usually the ones that catch your attention. Just imagine an agent sitting in front of a computer reading these query letters that go on and on and don't necessarily have anything that's special about them. And they might not be bad, but there's just not anything special about them. You've got to think in terms of I, how, do, how am I going to be the you know, one or two out of these hundred queries that they're reading that sticks out. Um, and you want to do that by, by writing a good query letter, not by using a gimmick. ST says to lay off of Elle Woods. Yeah. I love Elle Woods. <laughs> I'm admiring Elle Woods. Elle Woods. That worked I out for her. Just but... wouldn't do an Elle Woods for query. <laughs> exactly. So I think that one, one way to... I would say in terms of... I was going to say one way to address that is that, um, you know, there are other ways to make yourself attractive after the query letter. Do you guys believe that, um, that agents are looking at your entire package, your online platform, your social media links, your blogs, yes. mm -hmm. is that a place where you can show more voice, yep. more pizzazz? Yes. What do you need before you even query? What, what are the key essential parts of your platform that you must have? Or are there none? I mean, do you not even need to do that first? I mean, and none of it's going to be a complete make or break. If your book is good, your book is good and people are going to want it. Um, but definitely you want to have at least some kind of online presence. They're not necessarily expecting you to have, you know, like a million people following on, you know, your blog or your Twitter or your Facebook. Um, but they want to see that you know how to promote yourself, that you know how to handle interacting with people on social media because that's a bigger part of the business than it has ever, ever, ever been before. Um, I probably spend and just as much time promoting and doing stuff online as I do writing, um, which can be really stressful sometimes. But, uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is that's the business and that's where it's heading. And so um, I think agents do look for people who are at least competent. They want to see that you, you know, know what Twitter is and, you, and you're not that far behind yes. that time that you're like, what? Why won't it let me type more than two sentences? Kind of thing. Well, what's interesting to me is that when I first started querying, well, when I first started talking to agents, not even querying, I was, you know, encouraged to build a platform and to go, you know, find something to write about that was similar to my book. And I have a eco-lit novel. There's a big environmental bend in it. So I went to, and I got a job writing at Mother Nature News, which made a lot of sense. And I started doing articles and, you know, started to do that. And all of a sudden, somebody else said to me, you're building a platform, but are those people ever going to read your books? You know, are you going to get somebody who's reading a post about... And what happens when your next book is not about Ecolit? <laughs> well, and... Exactly. exactly. So, <laughs> and then the same person was like, if you're going to build a platform, then maybe self-publishing is a much better way to build a platform. And that's sort of how I have looked at that, not necessarily take the indie book and then send it to an agent, but look at that as a way to build. Do you guys see that happening? 
It, it definitely is. I can I tell mean, you it's, from a business perspective. Hmm. No, go ahead, KK. Hmm? You can go, Carol. It's okay. Um, no, that, I mean, I've just done a whole bunch of, sorry, I've done a lot of marketing related things before in terms of education and stuff. And in terms of how you should be building a platform, it's not as much of what you're writing about, it's who you're writing for. And that's a very big piece because technically you're going to be writing for the same people even if you start writing different kinds of books. Because if people love you and if people love the things that you write, at a certain point, if they love you that much, they will read anything you write. You just have to know who those people are. And that, I think, is more of a building a platform, not per se like, oh, I just wrote a book about cancer, so let me go find all the cancer people. They might not want to read my book. You know, the question is, who are the people who would want to be reading something I wrote? And figure out why, figure out who they are, where I can find them, what they all have in common, and then building a platform based on those people that you're writing for. Because you're writing for somebody. You're not just writing for the whole wide, big wide world. The whole big wide world will not like your book. Sorry. <laughs> there are going to be people who hate you, regardless. And if you know who you're writing for, finding them is a lot easier. And then building a platform based on those people. So Cora, as an example, right, she writes about awkward people who find love. So you you'd be like, idea. well, who would... <laughs> yes, and God bless you. And then the question becomes... Who would want to read about awkward people finding love? Awkward people, you know, people of the same age group. You have to, like, narrow it down because the entire world, the non-awkward people who think they're so cool, won't want to read about awkward people finding love because they probably won't enjoy it. So you have to figure out – so Cora's platform partially is, you know, the awkward love – you know, awkward people need love too. And that is, you know, it's a great example because – that sentence alone, kind of as a tagline, I guess, for the lack of a better word, really helps people, when they find you, narrow down if, if you're somebody they're interested in or not. Because mm -hmm. if they're like, hey, that sounds fun, I'm awkward, I like love, I'll read her book, you know, but if someone's like, I'm not awkward, I am the coolest of cool, you know, they'll just walk away and it's good because they're not going to read your books anyway. So I think a lot of that is based on more who you're writing for and not what you're writing about. If that's, that makes a, any sense that's whatsoever. About your brand. Yeah. That's a fantastic point, Katie. Like, so, for instance, uh, you, know, you brought up cancer, so it just it brings it yes. me. So my wife uh, works very intimately with cancer stuff, and mm -hmm. so and she's a big reader like I am, and I use, I'm her reading recommendation list. And, you know, I read The Fault in Our Stars, and I loved it. Like, it's a beautiful book, um, very, you know, the John Green book, you know, all about cancer and such. But like she, she won't read it, and that's and I, you know, if, if you know what she does, like that's totally understandable. And exactly. what you're saying is like definitely about knowing your marketing. Like just because your book has, you know, is intimately involved with cancer, doesn't mean that you should be marketing no. it to, you know, the I have cancer hashtag. That may be a little bit too close to home no. for them, you know. I don't and so, think they'd want to read it. yeah, that's an awesome point. I think it's a really good point. I think another big part about platform, when we talk about platform, um, we tend to think in big picture things. We think about things like brand and about who you're trying to reach in your market. Um, but it's also, it's more than that, it's, it's cultivating those people. So once you have people who follow you, it's making connections with them and talking with them, um, which again, yes. it's part of why I said that half of my job is spent doing promoting. I call it promoting, but really, um, it's not always direct promotion. Um, you know, more often than not, it, it isn't. It's um, you know answering uh, you know messages on Facebook and Twitter and and tweeting people and um, and and building your platform sort of that way too um, on a personal like person to person level. I can't tell you um, the number of times I, I make I go out of my way at signings, especially um, to have individual conversations with each people that um, comes to see me. Um, that she often, does. Um, it, it frustrates. <laughs> it can be frustrating because my line usually ends up really long, and I'm a talker, and so um, I'll just I'll just gab forever. Um, but even so, I, that taking like an extra one to two minutes to talk to each of those people, I have so many fans who tell me, you know, I, you know, I loved your books, I read this, I loved it, but now I will absolutely buy anything that you write because I, you know, I've met you and I've talked to you and I, you know, have this connection. Um, and so that's a big part of platform too, is not just 
you know, thinking with the business side of your brain, but also thinking about personal connections yes. and how you maintain that platform. Well, and that, that works across all markets. Like that works, like if you're buying a car, yes. for instance, if you go to a right. Ford dealership, let's say, and you have a great salesman that treats you right and they respect you and they're not trying to get all pushy and up mm -hmm. in your business, you buy that first Ford, like you're going to love yes. that car. Like you just are going to go into it with that impression that I'm going to love this car because this guy was awesome. Like I had a really great experience. Mm -hmm. I want to mention one tweet real fast because uh, mm -hmm. this is the second time Cora's brought up Twitter, and I thought this was great. It's it's you know, re regarding finding an agent, uh, and actually Chris Fox tweeted or asked a question about this earlier. But basically, uh, <laughs> the best Twitter name ever, Miss Dolly Lama, says, "Oh, uh, Dahlia. Yeah, Dahlia, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, Dahlia." <laughs> That's it. That is, Dahlia has the best Twitter handle. Uh, she says she, basically she many does. authors put their agents in their Twitter bios now, which is true. Uh, yes. Most authors, if they have an agent, they put it right there up front. Just start, you know, start snooping authors that you enjoy or that write in your genre, and you can probably find them that way. So. Oh, yeah. Become a professional I, snoop. Yes, and look in, in, find your favorite books, too, and look in the acknowledgement section. Um, when I, yeah. I was, the my first yes. query go round, which was, several years ago, and it was with a YA manuscript, and I had queried over 100 agents. <laughs> um, but the way that I found people is, I mean, I did the, the normal stuff. I looked, uh, you know, online. I looked at interviews. I looked at, um, you know, the different, like, websites where you can find agents. But I also, I would go to my local Barnes & Noble, and I would just start pulling books off the shelf, books I read, and even books that I hadn't read that looked like they might be a good fit. Um, and I would just flip back to the acknowledgments, and then I would take a picture of the agent name with my phone, and then I would look it up later when I got home um, to see yeah. who was actively actively making sales. Um, once I, I got Publishers Marketplace, that didn't necessarily become as much. Like, it kind of became a moot point because I could just search it all and didn't have to go to the bookstore. Um, I definitely recommend, we already talked about it, but Publishers Marketplace, whether you're querying or not, even on the, the self-pub side uh, of things, I, if you're a self-publisher, I highly recommend getting that subscription. It's not that expensive, and they even have like a sort of free weekly option that you can do too if you don't want to pay the subscription fee. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, a remarkable, it's a remarkable tool that will sort of help you keep your thumb on the pulse point of the market and know where things are going. It also gives you email addresses and you know whether or not people what people are looking for and mm -hmm. you can know exactly not just who's mentioned them in the acknowledgments but what they've sold that maybe hasn't been out yet so you can see what mm -hmm. they've been doing in the past 12 months as opposed to what happened before then. Right. Yeah. Michael Simcoe asked a good question that you guys have both started to touch on a little bit. Meeting people in person is more important in writing than you would think just when the impression yes. of writers is that we all sit and hide in our pajamas behind a computer all day. What are your thoughts on going places to meet agents? Is it worthwhile to try to meet some in person? Are you better off in the slush pile? How do you, you know, how do you handle both of these sides of, of both of these options? And are there any places that, you know, really matter if you want to go the in person route? Um, uh, it's ugh. it's here's my from <laughs> being on the agent side of things and going to conferences as an agent. Um, I can tell you, I mean, it's nice to meet people in person, but um, often what happens at conferences is that um, the agents and, and editors, too, they'll say, they'll say yes to almost everything, um, Just especially to be editors. polite in person? Yes. Editors are, are worse at it than agents are, I think, because agents are used to telling people no more than editors are. I mean, editors... Tell people no plenty of times, but not quite with the widespread numbers that agents do. They tell uh, the agents but, who are, that's their right, job. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, especially when I, I mean, when I went to conferences with editors, the editors would just request everything that came to them, and, and even if they weren't necessarily interested. And so sometimes, uh, I, I just don't, I, I don't completely buy into the fact that you, you definitely don't have to go to a conference. It certainly can't hurt, especially if the conference is reputable and they're going to have you know, good workshops that you can also learn um, things about your craft too, not just meet agents. Um, but I definitely wouldn't pin all your hopes and dreams on meeting an agent in person and like blowing their socks off with your personality because they can like you a whole lot. I met people at conferences that I liked a lot and I actually still talk to some of them. 
I never represented them because the book still wasn't right. It didn't matter how much I liked them. Right. And I've, I've gone yes. to a couple conferences where, you know, I, the first conference that I went to was the SCBWI conference in New York, and there were a mm -hmm. number of agents that were there, and you could sort of get a vibe on their agency and their personalities, kind of like um, Cora was saying before, do you want somebody who's going to hold your hand or somebody who's going to call you only when they have news? And that was really helpful for me because there were a couple people that I was like, ooh, I would die to work with them, and a couple other people that I was like, I might never query them because they might be awesome, but I'm not feeling it. Right. So that was helpful for people... Yeah. For people who are looking for a place to go and at least get a sense of agents, I didn't necessarily query anybody that I met there, but I sure learned a lot about, you know, some of the different agencies in town and the way that they seem to like to work. Not like it's everything, but it was a good it was a good place to start and it's obviously a very yeah. different impression than you can get online. Yeah, definitely. I think also part of meeting people in person isn't necessarily, you know, that you're going to blow their socks off, you're going to just whip out your manuscript and start reading, which you shouldn't do ever. No. <laughs> don't Please don't. don't. <laughs> but, no, guys, I mean, like, like, you roll up to an agent saying, let me just whip this out. Like, uh, you're going to make it. You're going to pop. It happens. That's a blazing so, saddle. It people happened. will, like, pull out their five pages in the bathroom. Like, I was, like, washing my hands, and someone was, like, <laughs> like handing me sample pages, and I was like, oh, God. You just want to cry. It's terrible. I think part of the whole going to conferences, the draw as a writer should be building relationships with other writers and, you know, finding out more information. If you meet agents, you know, it's great to know more people in the field just so you have a better sense of what's going on. But it's not so much for me, you know, as I'd be like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to meet my agents of my dreams, I'm going to ride off to the sunset, and it's going to be beautiful, and I'm just going to write New York bestsellers for the rest of my life, and etc. Like, no. It's going to meet people. And the relationships that you find there, you know, be it other authors, be it agents, be it editors, meeting people in the same industry as you is always a handy thing. Because you never know when people are going to, you know, roll back around into your life. And being on good terms with people is always a good thing no matter what business you're in. And that comes back to, you know, being an author also is you want people to remember you in a positive light. And that's what, you know, part of what I get what Cora calls promoting is that you just promoting the easiest way to promote is just being a nice person. It's <laughs> really like that's it. Just be, just like, want to talk to you again. Yes, Me if you're a nice person, <laughs> if you're a nice person, then chances of me wanting to buy something you wrote have multiplied because I like you as a person. And yeah. if I already have positive feelings toward you, then the chances of me having positive feeling toward your book has, you know, upped the ante. And there are some authors that I will not read their books no matter how many people, you know, like, oh, you should read this book because I don't like, you know, I don't like them as a person, which is, you know, there are people who have these terrible reputations of not being nice people. I'm like, you could write the best book known to mankind, and, you know, there's a whole ethics and, you know, conversation, you know, do we like the art and do we like the people behind the art? But I just, I won't pick up the book because I, there's nothing drawing me to it. Because if I know the person behind it, that is either going to work as an extreme advantage or a disadvantage depending on who that person is. And I think that's the case in terms of, you know, finding an agent also. Yeah. For on an agent's perspective, if they meet you and they hate you because you're <laughs> annoying or whatever, it doesn't matter how good your book is. <laughs> They're not going to want you. So yeah. I think a lot of it is, is just in terms of how you interact with people and having having things to back up, you know, Absolutely. You're, what you're saying is a big deal, I, you know. So have a good book just don't and be then a don't be a jerk. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm waiting for the that goes for, for from tonight. That goes for, yeah, yeah. that goes for interacting, like, that's the same that's as how life. we, you know, we tell... We tell authors not to reply to reviews. <laughs> um, oh don't my God, reply please, guys, to don't rejection. Do don't do that. Don't, don't do reply well, to just, rejection. Just, you should say no, thank you no. for your consideration and your time. No, nope. you, you can that, say that's... that, but it doesn't matter. They don't care. You don't okay. have to. Um, yeah, that's the day I quit okay. this. Is like when I get a when I get a response back to a query letter from an agent, and they're like, "I love your writing, but I hate you as a person." <laughs> That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for it's that. It's not lady. gonna happen to you, EJ. <laughs> no. I'm waiting for that fan but to roll up. You, I love your story. You wouldn't be surprised the person. number of ungrateful people though that that yeah. 
rejections. And sadly, it's often to rejections when the, the agent has taken the time to actually give feedback, which yeah. again, as right. you mentioned like seven billion times, they're working for free. And you, you know, they went out of their way to give this. And the number of times people respond to that criticism in a very poor and very um, disrespectful manner is astounding. You you think it would be a much smaller yes. percentage than it is. No, you think it's no, like it's, the it's like really the rare thing that happens every once in a while. No, it happens no. on a pretty. I mean, uh, being being told no makes people crazy. I mean, it, it, does. it really does. Like certain it's people, hard. it it sends them over the edge. So. But guess what's going to happen? Right. You're going to get the agent, and then you're going to go on submission, and chances are <laughs> someone's going to say no. Right. And it's true, and, and, and that's, that's universal and to self-publishing as well. Because and then they, you're going to publish, and then, you know, one day you're going to have a book published, and people are going to hate your book. Right. And then what are you going to do? If you can't handle rejection from an agent you're gonna reply who genuinely to the just review wants the best from you, forget and it. You're you going happen. out in a ball of fire already. And it just doesn't go. get better. Like, go I know back some to people, kindergarten. People go to self-publishing to avoid that, and I'm like, you're not, it, you're no. going to get it there too. Oh, no, 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 no. You're going to get those reviews yeah. that are just horrible. They're going to not get your story yes. at all, and they're going to just they're like gonna you. They're going to hate you for no reason. Right, exactly. You, you got and to even, it's almost even harder coming from you know a self-pub perspective because then when people don't like things, it is 100% on you yeah. <laughs> as opposed to you know yes. when you have an editorial team behind you and marketing and things like that. Um, you can kind of like sh uh, shift the blame. shift and share the blame, um, yes. but when it's when when you're you know when you've self published something and people and people react negatively to it, that can be a real like, killer to the to the ego and your yes. you know your artistry um, because you're you can get a little wrapped up in that in that negativity. It's, yes. it's nice to be able to share that with other people. Well, that is the perfect segue. That's a perfect uh, Just a little piece right of now. advice. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. I teach preschool. I teach preschool during <laughs> the day, and many of life lessons you learn I as a preschool bet. child. And so this is this is my life lesson from preschool to the adult universe. If somebody says something that's not nice to you. You don't have to say something back. <laughs> you don't need to hurt them. You don't need to go and tattle on them to everybody else. Sometimes what you just need to do is realize that they might be having a bad day or there's just, you know, some people just aren't very nice and what you need to do is walk away. Yes. And walk that. Away. Also remember the internet <laughs> is forever. Just, it's okay. Yes. Internet yes. Although we don't teach that in preschool, no. because what a, what a boring I imagine they like will not, begin begin. Teaching I've been it. singing Frozen all week with my children. <laughs> I am not a boring teacher. That is awesome. But but I do not you. teach at the school of hard knocks. No. <laughs> oh, I do, but we learn that we don't hit each other over the head with a block if somebody takes a block from you. Oh man. You know, if somebody takes them. Yes, you know, throwing furniture across the room is not encouraged. We use our words, not our hands. You know the usual things that you should learn for later in life when you're an adult and are on the internet. <laughs> exactly. Another important thing. Well, you guys made a great segue to the last thing that we wanted Sometimes to talk about. Sometimes people are going to say not nice things to you. Sorry, I think we're on a bit of a delay. But I do want to get some input from you guys on this last thing, and that is this. You know, agents used to hold the golden keys to the kingdom, and you really couldn't publish a book without getting one because you couldn't get to the publishers without getting an agent. Now there are many alternate routes. What should you look for if you're not going to find an agent? Who can you bring on your team besides other writers that can further your publishing career? Are you looking for a small press publisher? Are you looking for a publicist? Are you looking for an editor? Like where do you where do you guys what key things do people need to ask to make a match with any of these people. You can talk about them individually if you have specifics for one over the other, but I think that just like dating, and this is our Valentine's Day episode, so we're kind of, you know, drawing a parallel with what happens when you look for somebody that you want to spend time with as a date. What do you want to look for in some of these other people that can really build out your team and build out your brand and sell your books with you? Cora, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so if you if you've decided that you know age, getting an agent is not the route for you, um, 
and, and you've decided that you don't necessarily need that that middleman, and you don't necessarily need to go for traditional publishing. Um, like Amy said, you've got options. You've got self pub. You've got you know smaller like EPUB presses. Um, there are um, you know the larger traditional publishers. Um, typically, if you're writing NA especially, um, or if you're writing romance, a lot of them have. Um, Imprints that are open to unsolicited submissions. I know um, I'm with HarperCollins, and um, Avon Impulse has uh, they're open to unsolicited submissions. Um, so there are a lot more ways around it nowadays. Um, but what you have to keep in mind, um, if you, um, I'll talk about self-publishing first because that's what I did. Um, but if you if you're going to self-publish, you have to keep in mind that. Um, Everything that the publisher does, all of the different aspects of work that they put into a book, you're now in charge of putting all of those different aspects of work into that book by yourself. Um, so you are suddenly not just the author, you are also you know, the designer and the editor and the um, copywriter and the proofreader and cover designer unless you hire out for those things. Um, and so unless you are really great at those things, um, I would definitely recommend that you hire out. Uh, I know everyone's sort of financial situations are different whether or not you um, actually can do that. Um, but again, you have to think of it in terms of a business and so you want to give yourself every leg up that you can. So if you're going to self-publish, I highly recommend that you have um, an editor that you hire. Um, I highly recommend hiring a cover artist unless you are skilled in graphic design. Um, and then I definitely recommend hiring either a publicist or um, there are a lot of great bloggers out there who um, will do, they have sort of blog tour companies um, that will organize a blog tour for you. Um, those are the things that I think you, you need, um, especially in NA right now because it's such a crowded market um, that it's, it's a different world. It's hard to stand out. Uh, I mean, when I self-published Losing It, I, I give all these pieces of advice. I didn't follow any of them when I self-published Losing It. I, I made my own cover. Um, my mother, who is a very talented grammarian, um, she was an English teacher, but she was my editor. And, um, and then in terms of publicity, um, I, um, my sisters and I run a book blog, and we sort of organized my own blog tour. Um, and so I sort of did everything in-house. Um, if I were to do that today, if I were to self-publish losing it, the same book all over again in the same manner, I don't think it would stand out and I don't think it would have done what it did back then. Um, it was a different market then. But things are so crowded right now that you need every leg up that you can possibly get. Um, so don't self-publish on a whim. That would just be my advice. Um, any publishing is great and it works out really well for a lot of people. There's a lot of control and creativity and it can definitely be um, financially um, much more beneficial than um, traditional publishing um, depending on how your sales are. Um, but don't go into it thinking it's going to be easy or thinking that everything's going to click into place. You are taking over the job of an entire publisher that has hundreds of people on staff um, and you are taking over all of those aspects of the work. And so you have to be, able, be prepared and be knowledgeable enough about all those different things to make it work. So really what, you're saying, really what you're <laughs> saying is if you want to go in that way, unless you're going to go to one of the either large publishers that have uh, an imprint that's available without being agented for submission or if you want to do it yourself, you have to look to be dating quite a number of people to fill in a lot of those blanks. You do. I mean, you 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 certainly don't have to have all of those people, but like I said, um, it becomes it becomes harder and harder. And um, you know, the more aspects of those different jobs that you take on yourself, the less time you have to write. Um, it's always going to be more beneficial hiring out. Um, as long as you're hiring people that are, um, you know, reputable, um, that can be one of the scary things. Like when you're hiring editors, especially, um, try to get recommendations from other authors that you admire, um, from friends, things like that. That's how you want to find editors. That's how you want to find publicists. Um, if you can't get a personal recommendation, do your research. Um, yes. Do your research more yes. so even than if you've learned anything from tonight. Do your research, yes. Don't be, um, 
do, you, do your research and don't be a jerk. Yes. Yes. It's, I mean, we talk about all the time how uh, you know a bad agent can be worse for you than no agent at all. Yes. Uh, it's the same yes. way with all of these other aspects of of these other people that you're matchmaking with. A bad publicist yes. can can go a long way to harming a book. Um, a bad cover. Oh God, a bad cover. Yeah, can oh my shoot, God. Oh can my God. Can shoot you in the foot. Bad editing can also kill you. I can't tell you yes. the number of times um, that you know I see self-published books where people rave about the story, but they're like, ah, oh, but I just it's couldn't finish it because painful. the grammar was so bad. Um, and all of those things can cry. shoot you in the foot. Yes, and then you want to yes. cry. Um, because so personal there's so much the potential best. that has just been flushed down the toilet because you yes. do your research. And that's the... The one thing, um, uh, Amy and I talked about this sort of, I can't remember whether it was during our chat or not, um, and this goes for agenting and on the self-pub side of things. Um, when we, we mentioned earlier how when people self-pub and then um, try to get an agent, um, that it's kind of one of those deals where it's like you, you've already done it. It's already published. So unless your book is selling incredibly well and they can sell it off to another publisher, um, you kind of, you know, you've already you've already done that. You've already put the period at the end of your sentence, and now you have to move on. Um, it's kind of the same way when you're just when you're self-publishing something. Like once you've put that book out there, and once you've you know done everything you're gonna do, um, I mean, it's out there. You can rebrand, but you never get to start completely over. Um, and that's what you know why why it's so painful to read a great book that has terrible editing because you're like oh think about how many fans you lost that aren't gonna read your second book because of that and if you had just taken care of everything the first time around you might have done a better job of you know building your your fan base and, and holding on to those people. Hey Amy, well, I just yes. want to ask. So I guess they. Uh... Cora, you and KK had mentioned earlier that you might be willing to give away a copy of one of your books, an uh, e-copy, yeah. is that correct? Yeah. So yeah. I asked on Twitter earlier, give us like your best or worst opening line from a query, and I chose one here that I, I just thought it was pretty. I'll be honest, like I didn't have any rhyme or reason behind this. Other than that, I, really, I just liked it. I thought it was Biased. Uh, it's from S.A. Turnbull. I have no idea who this person is, so S.A., if you're listening, then you're awesome. Uh, on an isolated <laughs> island beneath a lush canopy of resurrection ferns, prickly palmettos, a Victorian colony festers. It's a long sentence, but I think it's a pretty one. <laughs> so, so we have chosen you for the winner, and we will try to get in touch with you to send you some ebooks. Yay! Yeah. Awesome. Well, EJ, thank you for reminding us of the time because it is ten o'clock. And uh, Kate, do you have any any last quick words of wisdom about matchmaking? If you're not going to go the agent route, like what to find, what to look for, anything to add on to what Cora suggested? I definitely agree with Cora in terms of the if you cannot do something well yourself, do not do it because it's you know we've said this a million times, it's a business. And mm -hmm. you need to treat it professionally. And you, if you want it to be your career, you need to treat it like you would treat any other career. You and wouldn't try to roof your own house. So you wouldn't try, try to roof your own <laughs> house. <laughs> so don't try oh, to do that. Oh, that is a lot about this week. Yeah. No, kidding. So there, you would not try to perform surgery on yourself. You would not try to give yourself a tattoo or even a haircut if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, because you the only try, person who's... But... It's the only person who's going to suffer if you mess up is going to be you. Definitely don't and try the tattoo so that's, thing. Mm, yeah, those are forever, yeah. except for not really, but almost forever. <laughs> Haircuts grow back, but don't, don't. You'll hate yourself. Thank you guys so, so uh, much. Thank, thank you guys you. so much for all your input and for coming on with us. You guys can see more of... Cora and KK, they did some quick video interviews for us so you can learn more about their books and where to meet up with them. And I'm sure they'll be looking out at Twitter later if you have other questions or want to tweet with them. Hey, EJ, thank you so much for being our Twitter guy tonight. You all are very welcome. It was wonderful. So I was happy to do it. All right, and it is 10.04, so we are sorry for keeping you guys longer, but we hope that it was okay. We are wishing everybody a happy Valentine's Day. And say thank you very much and see you next week. We're going to talk all about street teams. This is Amy Evans signing out.